I remember the day everything began to change. It was a Tuesday morning, just like any other, except it wasn't. I was in the kitchen trying to get breakfast ready for Alex, our four-year-old, who was energetically running around. Mark was in the dining room, already buried in his phone, probably checking emails from work. I met Mark at his family's company. I started in the marketing department. He was in finance. We hit it off at a company picnic. Two years later, we were married. I thought it was love, but after the wedding, things changed. Mark and his family insisted I become a housewife. It's for the best, they said. I didn't realize then that it was the beginning of losing myself. Mommy, I want pancakes, Alex's voice cut through my thoughts. Coming right up, honey, I replied, flipping a pancake on the skillet. Mark's voice, sharp and cold, sliced through the morning air. Karen, are you going to take all day? I have an important meeting. Sorry, just finishing up here, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. The clatter of plates as I set them on the table seemed louder than usual. Mark barely glanced at the breakfast. This bacon is undercooked, he muttered, pushing the plate away. I felt a sting in my chest, but I swallowed it down. I'll make a note of it for next time, I said, plastering a smile on my face. Alex, oblivious to the tension, chatted away about his toy cars. I envied his innocence. Mark's mother, Helen, chose that moment to make her grand entrance as if on cue. Karen, darling, let me show you how to cook bacon properly. Mark likes it crispy. I watched as she took over my kitchen, my home, my life. Helen had always been the matriarch, overseeing everything with a critical eye, and there I was, her project. You have to let it cook on low heat for longer. You'd know if you paid more attention, Helen said, flipping the bacon with an air of superiority. Mark nodded in agreement, not meeting my eyes. Mom knows best, he said. I bit back a retort focusing on Alex's bright smile as he munched on his pancakes. As they left the kitchen, Helen with a satisfied smile and Mark still glued to his phone, I stood there amidst the sizzling pans and the half-eaten breakfast, feeling more alone than ever. As days turned into weeks, the distance between Mark and me grew. It was like living with a stranger. He came home late left early, and we barely spoke. I tried to bridge the gap, but it was like talking to a wall. One evening I decided to make his favorite spaghetti bowl, and I spent hours in the kitchen, hoping it would bring back a spark, anything. I set the table, lit candles, even put on some music, the kind we used to dance to. When Mark finally came home, he didn't even notice the effort. He just slumped into his chair, eyes fixed on his phone. "'What's this?' he asked, poking at the spaghetti. "'I thought I'd make your favorite. I said, my voice barely above a whisper. He took a bite and grimaced. "'It's too salty. Didn't you taste it?' I felt a lump in my throat. "'I... I thought it was okay,' I stammered. He pushed the plate away. "'I'm not eating this.' I'll order a pizza. My heart sank as I cleared the untouched food. It felt like I was throwing away more than just spaghetti. Alex, bless his soul, tried to lighten the mood. Mommy, can I have pizza too? Of course, sweetie. Of course, I managed to smile for him. But the silence that followed was deafening. Mark ate his pizza eyes glued to the TV while I picked at my food. The gap between us felt like a chasm. The next day was no different. I was folding laundry when Mark walked in, his face like a thundercloud. Can't you do something about all this mess? He snapped, kicking at a toy car Alex had left on the floor. I try to keep up, but with Alex, it's a bit challenging, I replied, my patience wearing thin. Well, try harder. It's not rocket science to keep a house clean, he retorted, not even looking at me. I bit my tongue, counting to ten in my head. 
I'm doing my best, Mark. Your best isn't good enough, he muttered, storming off to his office. The spare room he had taken over. It was like this every day. The man I married, who used to make me laugh, who used to listen, was gone. In his place was this cold, indifferent person I barely recognized. That night, as I lay in bed listening to Mark's even breathing, I realized how alone I felt. The man lying next to me might as well have been a million miles away. I missed the warmth, the love, the connection we once had, but most of all, I missed the man I thought I married. And in the darkness, a thought crept into my mind. Maybe this was the beginning of the end. Things took a sharp turn when Mark got promoted to head of the family company. It was as if that title flipped a switch in him. He started coming home even later, sometimes not at all. When he was home, it was like living with a king who thought his castle wasn't good enough. One evening, he swaggered in, reeking of expensive cologne and self-importance. Karen, we need to talk about your appearance, he said, eyeing me like I was a piece of outdated furniture. I was taken aback by his suggestion. What about it? he sighed, like he was explaining something to a child. You've let yourself go. It's embarrassing. I'm the head of a major company now. I can't have you looking like this. I felt my cheeks burn. I'm taking care of Alex and the house. I don't exactly have time for a beauty routine, I said. He rolled his eyes. Excuses. If you cared enough, you'd find the time. Get a gym membership. Do something. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. So it's all about appearances for you now? What happened to loving me for who I am? He scoffed. That was before I realized I could do better. Shape up, Karen, or I might have to make some changes. I was speechless. The man I'd loved, the father of my child, was telling me I wasn't good enough for him anymore. I felt like I was drowning, and he was the water. The next day, I tried to talk to him about it, hoping he'd been in a bad mood and didn't mean it. He was in the kitchen, sipping his expensive coffee, scrolling through his phone. Mark, about last night, I think we need to talk, I started, my hands trembling. He didn't look up. Not now, Karen, I have a meeting. But this is important. You hurt me, I insisted. He finally looked at me, his eyes cold. I said what needed to be said. You're the one who needs to change, not me. I felt a tear slide down my cheek. You used to love me the way I was he snorted. That was before I realized my worth. You should, too. I walked away, feeling a piece of my heart break off. The man I'd married was gone. In his place was this stranger who judged me, who made me feel small and worthless. That night, as I lay in bed listening to the silence of the house, I realized I had a choice to make. I could stay and wither away under his contempt, or I could leave and try to find myself again. It was a terrifying thought, but for the first time in a long time, I felt a flicker of hope. Maybe, just maybe, I could be strong enough to start again. It was at one of those overly formal family dinners that I felt the full weight of being disregarded. The dinner table was set like something out of a magazine, but the atmosphere was anything but warm. Mark and his father, John, were absorbed in discussing the family business. I sat there, a silent observer, my presence seemingly forgotten. The quarterly reports need serious attention. Sales must pick up, John stated, his voice firm and businesslike. Mark was quick to respond. We're considering expanding our marketing, maybe even breaking into new international markets. Hearing this, I couldn't help but speak up. Marketing was my turf, my passion, before I was reduced to just a housewife. Have you thought about leveraging digital marketing? Social media platforms could be a great way to widen your reach, I suggested, a bit hesitantly. There was a pause, the kind that stretches just long enough to become uncomfortable. Then, to my dismay, John burst into laughter. 
Social media, really, Karen? It's endearing that you want to help, but let's leave the business talk to us, shall we? Mark joined in with a patronizing chuckle. Keep to what you're good at, Karen. Let us handle the business. I felt a flush of embarrassment and anger. I have a background in marketing. My suggestions are valid, I retorted a little more sharply. John dismissed me with a wave of his hand. That was years ago, dear. You're out of touch. You have other responsibilities now. The rest of the dinner went by in a blur of humiliation and anger. Their words stung, belittling not just my ideas but my very identity. Later, needing some solace and support, I went to see my dad. He had always been my pillar of strength, the one who always encouraged me to pursue my dreams. Dad, they just brushed me off like I don't matter, I said, my voice tinged with frustration and hurt. Karen, I've always told you about Mark and his family's nature, Dad replied, his tone a mix of concern and a hint of, I told you so. I know, Dad, but I didn't expect it to be this bad. They treat me as if I'm invisible, I admitted, feeling defeated. Karen, you're not invisible. You're smart and capable. Don't let them diminish you, he encouraged, his voice firm. But I feel trapped, Dad. I don't know what to do, I confessed, feeling a sense of despair. That's when Dad surprised me. What if we shake things up a bit? I've got some money set aside from some successful investments. How about I buy shares in Mark's family company? I stared at him, certain I'd misheard. You're joking, right? No, I'm serious. It's high time someone showed them you're not to be underestimated. I laughed despite the situation. The thought of my dad, the outsider, getting involved in their precious family business was absurd yet strangely satisfying. Life as I knew it came crashing down one ordinary Tuesday. I had been feeling under the weather for a while, but I brushed it off as stress or fatigue. It wasn't until I found a lump that I couldn't ignore it anymore. The doctor's appointment was supposed to be routine, but it wasn't. Sitting in the sterile doctor's office, the words hit me like a ton of bricks. I'm sorry, Karen, but it's breast cancer. We caught it early, but you'll need immediate treatment. I sat there numb. Cancer? Me? It couldn't be, but the doctor's solemn face told me it was all too real. I... I have a son, a family. What... what are my options? My voice sounded distant, even to my ears. We'll discuss treatment plans, but it's important we start soon, the doctor said gently. I walked home in a daze. How do I tell Mark? How do I tell Alex? My mind was a whirlwind of fear and uncertainty. Mark was in the living room when I got home, glued to his laptop as usual. Mark, we need to talk, I said, my voice barely above a whisper. He glanced up, annoyed. What now, Karen? Can't you see I'm busy? I took a deep breath. It's serious. I went to the doctor today. I have breast cancer. For a moment, there was silence. Then he said something I'll never forget. Cancer? Great. Just what I needed. More drama. I stared at him, disbelief and hurt warring inside me. Mark, did you hear what I said? I have cancer, I repeated. He sighed, closing his laptop with a snap. Yeah, I heard you. So what? Does this mean more doctor visits? How is this going to affect me and the company? I was speechless. How could he be so callous? It means I need treatment, Mark. I need support. He stood up, pacing the room. Well, you better get it sorted quickly. I can't have you slacking off on housework and taking care of Alex. I felt like I was in some nightmare. Is that all you care about? The house? The work? What about me? He stopped, looking at me like I was a problem to be solved. Look, Karen, it's not that I don't care, but you have to understand the timing is terrible. We have a business to run. The rest of the conversation was a blur. 
His words were like daggers, each one cutting deeper than the last. I was alone, truly alone in this. The following weeks were a whirlwind of appointments, treatments, and overwhelming fatigue. I tried to keep up with the house and Alex, but it was too much. Mark's patience wore thin. One evening, after a particularly grueling treatment, I was too exhausted to cook. Mark, can we order in tonight? I'm just not up to it, I pleaded. He scoffed. Order in again? What do I keep you around for if you can't even cook a simple meal? It was a crushing blow, not just to my body, but to my heart. The day of my surgery loomed over me like a dark cloud. I was scared, not just of the surgery itself, but of what life would be like after. I would wake up less of a woman, or so I felt. My body, once a source of pride, was now a traitor. I didn't expect Mark to hold my hand and tell me everything would be okay. Those days were long gone, but I did hope for a semblance of support. Instead, what I got was indifference. As I was getting ready for the hospital, Mark was busy getting dressed for work. You'll be fine, right? The doctors know what they're doing, he said, not even looking at me. Yeah, I guess, I replied, trying to keep my voice steady. He paused, his hand on the door handle. Call me when it's done. I've got an important meeting. Can't miss it. I felt a lump form in my throat. Sure, I'll call. The surgery was a blur, but waking up was worse. I felt a void where part of me used to be. My parents were there when I opened my eyes, their faces etched with concern and love. Mom, Dad, I whispered, tears streaming down my face. We're here, sweetheart, we're here, Mom said, taking my hand. Mark didn't show up, not that day or the next. He didn't even call. It was as if my surgery, my cancer, was a minor inconvenience, best kept out of sight, out of mind. Recovery was slow and painful, but eventually I was allowed to go home. I dreaded it, not knowing what to expect from Mark. I arrived home to a shock. Mark wasn't alone. A young woman, maybe in her late twenties, was in my living room. She was laughing at something he said, touching his arm in a familiar way. Mark, what's going on? My voice was a croak, still weak from the surgery. He looked up, surprised, then his expression hardened. Karen, let's talk in the kitchen. In the kitchen he was blunt, cold. I want a divorce. I've met someone else. You, you're not the woman. I stood there numb, the pain from my surgery nothing compared to the pain in my chest. Divorce because of her, because of this. I touched the bandage on my chest, my voice rising. It's not just that you've changed, you're always so sad, so needy. I need someone vibrant, alive, not this. He gestured at me dismissively. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I have cancer, Mark. I had surgery. What did you expect? He shrugged. I don't know, but this isn't it. I've moved on. You should too. He handed me divorce papers, still warm from the printer. I want you out of the house. It's for the best. I looked at him, at the stranger he had become. Where am I supposed to go? That's not my problem. Figure it out. I packed a bag, my hands shaking. Alex was at my parents, thankfully spared from this nightmare. As I left, I looked back at the house, the life, the man I had once loved. It was all gone, replaced by a cold, harsh reality. After the divorce, I moved in with my parents, a shadow of my former self. The betrayal, the surgery, the cancer, it all took its toll. But it was in those moments of despair that something unexpected happened. I was sitting at the kitchen table with my dad, nursing a cup of coffee. The silence between us was comfortable. Dad broke it with a question that caught me off guard. Karen, remember when I said I was thinking of buying shares in Mark's company? I looked up, surprised. Yeah, I thought you were joking. He shook his head, a serious look in his eyes. I wasn't. I went through with it. I now own a significant portion of the company. I nearly dropped my cup. You what? He nodded. Yep, 
I use my investment savings. It's all legal and above board. I own 80% of the shares now. I was speechless. This was huge. Dad owning a majority of Mark's family company. It was the kind of twist you'd expect in a movie, not real life. But why, Dad? I managed to ask, still reeling from the shock. He took a sip of his coffee before answering. Because no one messes with my daughter. Plus, it was a good investment opportunity. It's a solid company, despite Mark. A part of me was overwhelmed by his gesture, but another part, a part I thought was long buried, felt a spark. Revenge wasn't my style, but justice. That was a different story. Dad, what are you planning to do with those shares? I asked, curiosity peaking. He grinned. Well, that's up to you, Karen. You have the business acumen, the marketing knowledge. You could do a lot with this opportunity. Me, running the company that once belonged to Mark and his family. It was ludicrous, audacious, and thrilling. But I'm not sure I'm up for it, I hesitated, doubt creeping in. Dad put his hand on mine, his ease kind. You're stronger than you think, Karen. You've been through hell and back. This could be your chance to rise from the ashes, to show them who Karen really is. The idea was crazy, but it was also empowering. For years, I'd been put down, made to feel small and insignificant. But now I had the power to change that, to turn the tables. I spent the next few days thinking about it, weighing the pros and cons, it wasn't just about revenge, it was about taking control of my life, about proving to myself that I was more than what Mark and his family thought of me. Finally, I made my decision. I was going to do it. I was going to take on the company, make it my own. It was a daunting thought, but for the first time in a long time, I felt a sense of purpose, a drive. Dad, I'll do it. I'll take over the company. I said, my voice steady and confident. Dad smiled, his eyes twinkling. I knew you would. I'll set up a meeting with the board. It's time they met the new majority shareholder. The day of the shareholders' meeting dawned, a day that would mark my foray into a world I had been shut out from for so long. I stood outside the company building, taking a deep breath. Inside, the board, along with Mark and his father, awaited the arrival of the new majority shareholder. They were in for a surprise. Dressed in my best suit, feeling more confident than I had in years, I pushed open the doors and walked into the boardroom. The looks on their faces were priceless. Karen, what are you doing here? Mark stammered, his face a mix of confusion and disbelief. I took my seat at the head of the table, feeling every pair of eyes on me. I'm the new majority shareholder. Thanks to my father's investment, I now own 80% of this company. There was a moment of stunned silence, then whispers broke out among the board members. John, Mark's father, was the first to recover. This has to be some kind of joke, he said, his voice gruff. No joke, John. I'm here to make some changes, I replied, my voice steady. Mark was still staring at me, his face pale. Karen, this is, this is crazy. You can't run a company, he protested. I smiled, a small satisfied curve of my lips. I think you'll find I'm more than capable. In fact, I have plans to increase profits and expand the company. Plans that involve modernizing our approach and embracing digital marketing, something I suggested before and was laughed at. The board members were now listening intently. I laid out my plans, speaking with confidence and knowledge. I saw nods of approval, even a few impressed glances, as the meeting drew to a close. Mark approached me, a desperate look in his eyes. Karen, please, let's talk about this. We can work something out. I looked at him, the man who had belittled me, betrayed me, and thrown me away when I was at my lowest. There's nothing to talk about, Mark. You made your choice. Now I've made mine. He reached out, but I stepped back. Karen, I'm sorry. 
I didn't know what I was doing. Please give me a chance. I shook my head, my resolve firm. It's too late for that, Mark. You showed me your true colors, and I've moved on. Leaving the boardroom, I felt a weight lift off my shoulders. I had come a long way from the broken woman who left Mark's house with a bag and a broken heart. I had taken control of my life, my future. The sun was setting, casting a warm glow over the city. I took a moment to savor it, the beauty of a new beginning. Here's to new beginnings, I whispered to myself, a smile playing on my lips.